So I've structured my remarks about economic crisis as fiction and drama in three parts. I want to begin with the making of historical fiction. In Capitalism and Freedom, the hymn to economic liberalism that Milton Friedman published in 1962, he named his nemesis and sought to destroy it. Lamenting the broadening government intervention in economic affairs, Friedman attributed it to the widespread belief that a capitalist system was prone to crisis. A private free enterprise economy, it is said, is inherently unstable. Left to itself, it would produce recurrent cycles of boom and bust. It was this belief, Friedman claimed, that created the impression that the government must step in to keep things on an even keel. Now, if the target of Friedman's attack was crystal clear, so too was his weapon, emphasizing that concerns about capitalism, stability, instability, were particularly potent during and after the Great Depression of the 1930s, Friedman sought to debunk the conventional wisdom about history's greatest economic crisis by claiming that the Great Depression, like most other periods of severe unemployment, was produced by government mismanagement rather than by any inherent instability of the private economy. Specifically, he accused the Federal Reserve System of exercising its monetary responsibility so ineptly as to convert what otherwise would have been a moderate contraction into a major catastrophe. Now, to pin the blame on government for capitalism's greatest crisis might seem implausible, if not preposterous. Certainly, it was at odds with the central tenet of leading economic interpretations of business cycles and crises at the time. Whether inspired by the writings of Jean-Charles Léonard Sismondi or Karl Marx, Eugen Bimbavark, or Friedrich Hayek, John Maynard Keynes, or Mikhail Kalecki, Joseph Schumpeter, or Wesley Clare Mitchell, economists tended to look to the internal dynamics of capitalist economies for the roots of crises and cycles. What Friedman was proposing, therefore, was no less than a rupture in traditional economic thinking about crises. Now, had he relied exclusively on capitalism and freedom to convince, his claims would have been easily dismissed. But he followed it with a weightier tone. Published in 1963, A Monetary History of the United States was co-authored by Friedman and Anna Schwartz and presented an analytical structure, an analytical narrative, I beg your pardon, of US monetary history from the Civil War until 1960. The book focused on disruptions to the relationship between money and income, which were presented as aberrations in the functioning of a capitalist economy. It was during these disruptive periods, Friedman and Schwartz claimed, that money mattered a great deal, even if it had no influence over income in the long run. And at no time, they suggested, did money matter more than in the 1930s. Friedman and Schwartz proposed an interpretation of the Great Depression that was provocative. But to make it plausible, they had to substantiate the two claims on which it rested. That the collapse in US national income during the Depression was caused by a decline in the money stock. And that the Fed's failure to act, this was the second claim, created an unnecessary depression rather than an ordinary recession. Now, that a decline in money caused income to fall was far from self-evident, as Friedman and Schwartz acknowledged, since causality in such a relationship could just as easily go in the opposite direction. Writing in the early 1960s, many economists would have looked to econometrics for a solution to prove their point. But Friedman and Schwartz rejected that option, despite having the skills to exercise. They chose instead to use historical analysis to discern, as you see here, the antecedent circumstances whence arose the particular movements 
that become, become so anonymous when we feed the statistics into the computer. Drawing on a wide range of historical sources, their account of the Great Depression is an impressive effort to show that a series of declines in the stock of money in the US economy precipitated the diminution of the country's national income. Still, the attentive reader will notice that crucial movements in economic variables, notably the precipitous collapse of US industrial production, which is shown here in the middle curve, preceded the monetary events that Friedman and Schwartz emphasize. Substancing, substantiating their second claim was a bigger headache, but it was even more important to their thesis. After all, if banking panic had prompted the monetary contraction that brought national income hurtling downward, didn't that mean that capitalism was prone to financial panics and therefore unstable? To avoid that inference, Friedman and Schwartz constructed an elaborate counterfactual history of the 1930s, insisting that the Fed had ample powers to stop banking collapse and monetary deflation. 